Good morning. I am very honored to give this year's Edgar J. Poth Memorial Lecture. I want to take a moment to just review for everyone who is Dr. Poth and his importance to the Southwestern Surgical Congress. He was born in Seguin, Texas. He received his bachelor's and master's from the University of Texas, then went off to Cal, where he received his PhD, then on to Johns Hopkins for his MD, before eventually settling in Galveston, where he spent over 40 years in the Department of Surgery. He was the 15th president of the Southwestern Surgical Congress in 1963. After Clay asked me to give this year's POTH lecture, I decided to talk about clinical informed consent. We use it every day, but I would suspect that most of us do not realize how it evolved. I have no disclosures. Informed consent is an ethical concept that is codified in the law as in daily practice at every single healthcare institution. I plan to review what is an informed consent, when is it required, how did an informed consent evolve into what we have today, and what can we do to truly have informed consent? According to Merriam Webster, informed consent is a consent to surgery by a patient or to participation in a medical experiment by a subject after achieving an understanding of what is involved. Informed consent is a relatively recent term and concept. It wasn't used until 1957. A more complete definition is that it is a process by which the treating health care provider discloses appropriate information to a com competent patient so that the patient may make a voluntary choice to accept or refuse treatment. The three fundamental criteria that are needed for informed consent is that the patient must be competent, they must have the capacity to be able to understand and assess the information that they are given, communicate their choices, and understand the consequences of their decision. The physician must provide adequate information with a minimum being the diagnosis, the procedure with its risks and benefits, and the alternatives along with their benefits and risks, including doing nothing. The decision must be voluntary and not coerced. It is the physici physician's responsibility to obtain informed consent. This means that the physician must assess the patient's ability to understand the relevant medical information and the implications of treatment alternatives and whether they're able to make an independent voluntary decision. There is basic information that must be presented when obtaining an informed consent. The AMA and the California Hospital Association Association have listed the following as the minimum needed. Diagnosis, if it's known. The nature and purpose of the recommended intervention or procedure. The burdens, risks, and expected benefits of all options, including foregoing any treatment. The conversation with the patient that occurred when going over this information and the patient's decision must be documented in the medical record in addition to the written consent. In addition, the physician must disclose to the patient whether they have any conflicts of interest, such as being a consultant for a surgical equipment manufacturer. The federal government has mandated what is needed on the written consent form, and it's listed here. At a minimum, the name and signature of the patient and or their legal representative, the name of the hospital, the procedure, the names of all practitioners that are going to be involved in performing the procedure, the risks, the benefits, alternative procedures and their risks and benefits, the date and time of obtaining a consent, the statement that a procedure was explained to the patient, a signature of the, patient, of the person that witnessed the consent, as well as the name and signature of the person who explained the procedure. In a 2000 paper, this is in 2000, Betrell and colleagues found that of 157 hospitals, only 25% had consent forms that included even the basic elements of procedure, risk, benefits, and alternatives. A written informed consent is not necessary for every single thing that happens to a patient. A simple consent can be oral and is used for procedures such as phlebotomy or chest x-ray, which are considered simple and common. It's often included in the consent for hospitalization, which hospitals avoid to avoid the risk, or which hospitals obtain to avoid the risk of being held liable for kidnapping. 
A written informed consent is required when a procedure is considered complicated. But what's considered complicated? It varies from state to state and hospital to hospital. It's influenced by clinicians and interpreted by hospitals with recommendations from professional and specialty groups. The standard set forth by Joint Commission is that hospitals must establish and follow policies that prescribe which, or describe which procedures or care, treatment, and devices require informed consent. The Veterans Health Administration has a well-developed consent policy. Oral consent still requires meaningful discussion, but is acceptable for those treatments and procedures that are considered low risk, such as administration of drugs or vaccines, blood work, or routine x-rays. Complicated procedures for which written consent is needed are procedures that are expected to produce significant pain or discomfort or require sedation, anesthesia, or narcotic analgesia. Procedures that are considered to have a significant risk of complication or morbidity or any procedure that requires injections into a joint space or body cavity. In addition, they have a fairly long comprehensive list of procedures that also require a written consent. In obtaining consent, how much information is necessary to be given to the patient? How many potential risks must be described? How many alternatives? There have been three standards proposed over the years for what information must be given to the patient regarding a procedure. The professional practice standard, or what is a reasonable physician would provide. The reasonable person standard, which is what a reasonable person would expect to hear, and the subjective standard, which is what a particular patient would need to know and understand to make an informed decision. The reasonable physician standard is often inadequate, as a typical physician tells very little. The subjective standard is the most challenging to incorporate into practice, as it requires tailoring information to each individual patient. The scope of the physician's communications to the patient must be measured by the patient's need, and that need is whatever information is material to the decision. These standards have evolved, as we will see later, through the influence of the legal system. CMS has actually defined material risk as having a high degree of likelihood but a low degree of severity, as well as those complications with a very low degree of likelihood but high degree of severity. Hospitals are free to delegate to the physician who uses the available clinical evidence as informed by the professional judgment, the determination of which material risks, benefits, and alternatives will be discussed with the patient. This has made informed consent tricky over the years because how much is enough? A number of risk calculators have been developed with one of the most widely used being the surgical risk calculator from the American College of Surgeons. These can help determine the risk of operation for your patient and aid the discussion of risks and benefits. There are five recognized exceptions when informed consent of the patient is not necessary. A public health emergency, such as occurred during the Ebola scare, a medical emergency, patient waiver, therapeutic privilege, and when the patient is incompetent. A medical emergency is when the provider believes that a medical procedure is needed immediately and there's insufficient time to obtain the consent of the patient or their surrogate, or there is insufficient time to obtain the, uh, or the patient is unable to give consent. The law implies that if the patient were able to give consent, then consent would be given, or an implied consent. For definition purposes, a medical emergency exists when immediate services are required to alleviate severe pain or the immediate diagnosis and treatment of an unforeseeable medical condition that would lead to either serious disability or death if not immediately diagnosed and treated. The one that comes to mind as a, for a trauma surgeon like me is, of course, the gunshot wound to the abdomen. Legally, only the emergency condition may be treated. If the patient or the surrogate have refused treatment in the past, and the emergency condition arises because treatment had been refused, then the emergency treatment exception does not apply. There is a common misconception that a two-person consent is required when a patient would benefit from a procedure and the patient cannot give consent. No federal law permits two doctors to consent on behalf of the patient, no matter whether the patient has capacity to make health care decisions or not. 
There is also no legal requirement for a physician to consult a second physician to confirm the existence of an emergency. However, because hospital requirements may vary, this may be required by your hospital or medical staff policy. So it's something that you need to know about your own situation. If a emergency surgery is required, then written consent is not possible. You have to document the emergency and the need for operation in the medical record, i.e. the immediate treatment of the patient is necessary because of whatever. A third potential exception to informed consent is when the patient has requested not to be informed. This may de they may delegate the decision making to the physician. However, this is potential for abuse as there is a very fine line between a voluntary waiver after a suggestion versus a non-voluntary waiver after intimidation. Therapeutic privilege is a fourth potential exception to informed consent. A physician is not required to disclose information to the competent patient if the physician feels that such a disclosure would seriously harm rather than benefit the patient. Rarely, however, would a patient become so distraught or emotionally ill when given information about their condition that they require the physician to withhold information. This also has a very great deal of potential abuse as it conflicts with the patient's right to know and therefore possibly decline treatment. If the use of therapeutic privilege becomes necessary, it's important to document the facts and circumstances that led the physician to the decision to not give all of the information to the patient and what information was actually given to the patient. It's also important to document any discussion with the patient's designated surrogate. The fifth exception to informed consent is that of an incompetent patient. In this case, there is a need for determination of surrogate. As our patient population ages, this has become increasingly common. Any condition or treatment that affects cognition may impair decision-making capacity. Neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury, psychiatric illnesses, cognitive aging, or delirium may leave the patient unable to give informed consent. There is a large amount of confusion between the terms competence and capacity, although some authors will deliberately use them interchangeably. Competence is a legal term. All adults are presumed to be competent unless they're determined by a court to be incompetent. Capacity is actually task specific, and decision making capacity is determined by a clinician. Because capacity is task specific, it can be divided into eight different areas with the scope of abilities and skills that are required different for each capacity. For instance, a person who is unable to live independently is still able to give consent for a procedure. Living independently, the scope of abilities is broad and requires both cognition and procedural skills. But giving consent to a treatment requires a narrow scope, primarily that of cognitive ability. In determining whether a patient has decision-making capacity, the physician must determine whether they are capable of these four abilities, understanding, expressing a choice, appreciation, and reasoning. Understanding or the ability to know the meaning of the information is a key decisional ability. If the patient has a hernia, do they understand what is a hernia? The second ability is whether the person can express a choice, i.e., can they choose to have the hernia repaired? If they can frequently reverse their choice, this may actually lack, indicate a lack of capacity. The third ability required is that of appreciation. Appreciation is more than just knowing the facts essential to making a decision. It is about applying those facts to the person's own life. In this case, the person would recognize that they have a hernia. The last ability required is that of reasoning, or the ability to compare options and to infer the consequences of their choice. Like reasoning, appreciation will draw on the patient's core values and beliefs. In our patient with the hernia, they would need to compare the consequences of having or not having the hernia repaired. I now want to review how consent has evolved through the ages. Three ethical principles come into play in informed consent as we know it in 2017. Beneficence, respect for autonomy, and justice. Beneficence has played the biggest role over the centuries. Beneficence requires that the physician must promote the welfare of their patient and to do or promote good. Respect for autonomy 
as we will see, has only relatively recently been brought into the discussion of consent. Persons should be free to choose and act without controlling constraints imposed by others. The third ethical principle is justice and is more applicable to research consent, of which I'm not going to discuss today. In the principle of justice, there must be a just distribution of the burden of risk of research participation within society. The Corpus Hippocraticum is a collection of around 60 medical texts from ancient Greece associated with the Hippocratic school. Nothing in this collection remotely suggests obtaining consent from patients was attempted. In fact, the corpus bluntly advises of the wisdom of concealing most things from the patient while you're attending to him, or turning his attention away from what is being done to him, or revealing nothing of the patient's future or present condition. As we know from the Hippocratic Oath, a public pledge to uphold professional responsibility and to do no harm, Hippocratic medicine is firmly rooted in beneficence. In the medieval age, physicians traditionally held on to the Hippocratic traditions where the authoritarianism and obedience of patients was further strengthened by Christian theology. Henry de Monville was a French surgeon who carried on the Hippocratic tradition of beneficence. He recommended to his colleagues to promise a cure to every patient but to tell the, par the parents or friends if there are, is any danger. He considered that maintaining hope justified any deception necessary, such as saying, that if a canon is sick, tell him that his bishop just died, and the hope of succeeding him will actually quicken his recovery. He also recommended not to accept a case where the patient violently refused a medical intervention, i.e., they didn't give consent, as a patient who is screaming and fighting is unlikely to enhance the physician's good reputation. During the 1700s, Western medicine was still deeply rooted in the Hippocratic tradition with its core of beneficence. But there were now early stirrings of a less authoritarian flavor. Benjamin Rush was a physician who signed the Declaration of Independence. He had a background in classical learning that included reading philosophers such as Locke, Descartes, Hutchinson, and Smith. He firmly believed that physicians should share information with their, parent, with their patients. However, it was not in terms of respecting autonomy, but to allow the patient to better understand and be motivated to comply with the physician's recommendations. Rush's teacher, John Gregory, was a professor of medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Influenced by Francis Bacon, he realized the need to educate the patient in public as well. He viewed the role of the physician in the traditional terms of beneficence, but with more openness and honesty. In 1803, Thomas Percival, Britain, published his treatise on medical ethics, which provided a modern foundation for medical ethics in North America. Medical ethics was much more concerned with medical et etiquette and recommended gentlemanlike behavior. Influenced by the Reverend Thomas Gisborne, who opposed lying to patients, Percival struggled with how lying would affect the perception of the gentleman's image of the physician. Yet, beneficent would ultimately win out when deception was necessary to give hope. He felt that the role of the physician was to be the minister of hope and comfort. The AMA's first Code of Medical Ethics, published in 1847, borrowed heavily from Percival's text. Interestingly, passage by John Bell regarding truthfulness was included, yet it was in the section that was an introduction on the interaction of physicians with each other, not between physician and patient. After the publication of the AMA Medical Ethics, a Connecticut physician, Worthington Hooker, published a commentary on the code that is considered one of the most influential contributions to medical ethics by an American author in the 19th century, physician and patient. He denounced lying and deception in medicine. He criticized physicians for deceiving patients, doing unnecessary services, and studying the science of, getting, of patient getting to the neglect, to some extent at least, of the science of patient curing. In the early 1900s, physicians were more concerned about interactions between physicians. Remember, 1910 is when Abraham Flexner published his infamous report on medical education. Beneficence continued to be the main principle underlying the interaction between physicians and patients. Autonomy, however, is just beginning to be seen on the horizon. In the early 1900s, the legal foundation of informed consent was being laid. In law, informed consent is interpreted and grounded in the respect for autonomy. Case law is more directed toward the rights and duties to protect that patient's right to self-determination. The two legal theories that informed consent is derived from are battery and negligence. Battery is the intentional touching of a person in a harmful or offensive manner without their consent. 
In medicine, it can be a medical procedure without a consent, or a provider exceeds the scope of the consent, or performs a procedure for which the consent was not obtained. Battery can occur even if the intention is to aid the patient. The procedure is performed competently and with no adverse outcome. Negligence, as it pertains to informed consent, requires five elements. Duty to give information to the patient, the physician breaches that duty, an injury to the patient occurs, and is financially measurable. The injury is due to an undisclosed or possible outcome, and had the patient been informed of this outcome, a reasonable person would not have consented. Although there are a few cases that occurred in the 1900s, there are four cases from 1905 to 1914 that are considered the legal basis of informed consent. In Moore versus Williams, the physician had obtained consent to operate on the right ear, but then decided that the ear that really required operation was the left. The opinion from the court was that when entering into a contract, the physician can operate to the extent of the consent given, but no further. In Pratt versus Davis, there was no consent for a hysterectomy. This decision limited implied consent to emergencies or when the patient knows the consequences of allowing the physician to exercise professional judgment. In Rollator versus Strain, the patient gave consent to drain a foot infection, but specifically asked that no bone be removed. The physician removed a piece of bone. The operation was not performed as the patient and physician agreed. As a result, this opinion strengthened the patient's control. The most important case, however, was Schollendorf versus the Society of New York Hospitals, which drew on the opinions of the previous three for its decision. The patient consented to an abdominal exploration, but not an operation. The physician removed the fibroid anyway. Judge Cordozo's opinion is a landmark. Every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body, and a surgeon who performs an operation without his patient's consent commits an assault for which he is liable in damages. This is the first true description of the patient's right to self-determination. No significant changes really occurred with consent over the next 40 years. 40 years. It wasn't until 1957 when the case of Salgo versus Stanford gave further direction on what was needed for consent. The patient developed permanent paralysis as a result of the translumbar aortography. The opinion was that physicians have the duty to disclose any facts which are necessary to form the basis of an intelligent consent by the patient to the proposed treatment. It requires the disclosure of risks and alternatives, though it did give physicians discretion on what should be disclosed, a reasonable physician standard, and it's the first time that the term informed consent was used. In 1960, in the case of Natanson versus Klein, the physician did not tell the patient about the risk of burns from cobalt radiation for breast cancer. This was the first case to firmly ground the physician's informed consent liability in negligence theory rather than battery. If injury results from a known risk that is not disclosed to the patient, the physician may be liable. Three landmark cases in 1972 further determine the scope of the physician's communications to the patient. The amount of information must be measured by the patient's need, and that need by whatever information is material to the decision. In Canterbury, the patient underwent a laminectomy and postoperatively fell from his bed and was paralyzed. The court felt that the risk of possible paralysis should have been disclosed. Disclosure was based on a person's reasonable standard rather than a professional standard. In Cobbs versus Grant and Wilkinson versus Vesey, the decisions was more in line with the subjective standard. Whether a patient should proceed with a therapy requires reference to the values of that patient and thus are not exclusively medical determinations. From Cobbs, the scope of the physician's communications to the patient must be measured by the patient's need and that need is whatever information is material to the decision. What is considered material information was further clarified by Truman versus Thomas in 1980. The patient had repeatedly refused a pap smear, then died of cervical cancer. Her family sued, saying that she had never been told of the risk of not having a pap smear. This decision found that the physician must apprise the patient of risks of not undergoing treatment. If the physician knows or should know of a patient's unique concern, or lack of familiarity with medical procedures, this may expand the scope of required disclosure. 1973 was a tumultuous year. Watergate was leading to the impeachment of Richard Nixon. The American Hospital Association adopted the first patient's Bill of Rights, which further led to the use of informed consent. Statutory law 
saw was seen in the 1970s because there was a marked increase in the numbers of malpractice cases and increasing size of awards leading to skyrocketing insurance premiums. Between 1975 and 1977, 25 states enacted informed consent laws in an attempt to decrease malpractice liability. Statutory laws regarding informed consent now exist in all 50 states. Today, communication issues are the single most frequent cause of serious adverse events reported to Joint Commission. It's not surprising since communication is probably one of the hardest things that we do, and especially to do right. There are a multitude of barriers to understanding when attempting to obtain a truly informed consent. There may be ineffective provider-patient communication because of language differences, perhaps because of a lack of health literacy or cultural issues. It may also be due to physicians' reluctance to use a shared de decision-making technique. Zara Cooper, and I don't expect you to be able to necessarily read this, has looked at pitfalls in communication at the end of life and have found numerous potential causes for communication breakdown as illustrated here. And I think this also applies to informed consent. The communication issues can be on the part of the surgeon who doesn't have the time to be able to sit down and really have a conversation with the patient. Maybe the patient's own lack of health literacy or the surrogate or systemic factors that contribute to the communication difficulty. Language is one of the most common barriers. The federal government, through the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, requires interpretation and translation services. The culturally and linguistically appropriate services in healthcare is a national standard from DHHS that requires language assistance regardless of the number of language speakers in the community and at all points of contact and at all hours of operation. When a patient has limited English proficiency, you cannot require a patient to bring an interpreter. The interpreters that you have available must be qualified. You cannot rely on a minor child except in an emergency situation. You may rely on an accompanying adult if requested to do so by the patient themselves, and that person also agrees. But it's best to document in the medical record that a qualified interpreter was offered. Be very leery of relying on friends or family for interpretation. They may not be able to in interpret accurately due to inadequate knowledge of anatomy, physiology, or due to the stress of the situation. Cultural issues may also be a barrier. In some cultures, the decision maker is designated by the group. In others, a signature on a piece of paper as opposed to a verbal consent may convey a lack of trust. Illegal immigrants may fear deportation. In some Asian communities, the shaman or another person must be consulted before obtaining a decision. As you can see, we have gone through a number of models of providing information to patients. The paternalistic model, or the doctor knows best model, has been with a sense of Hippocrates and is rooted in beneficence. The information model, or informative model, developed as physicians were encouraged to give their patients all of the information and then let them choose. Now there is a transition to an interpretive or shared decision-making model. Shared decision-making informs the patient about the medical condition. It clarifies the patient understanding of diagnosis and tries to elicit what the expectations are for recovery. It identifies the patient's priorities and goals. It determines the health states the patient would find unacceptable. And it accepts self-determination as a desirable goal. It's up to the patient if they choose to have whatever treatment. The problem that we have with the recitation of risks, benefits, and alternatives is that it assumes the patient has already bought into a post-operative aggressive care. The alternative peer is secondary and not a real choice, however, it does solve the legal requirement. This can lead to unwanted aggressive treatments, post-operative stress and conflict between the surgeon and the patient and their family. Gretchen Schwartze has developed a best case, worst case framework as a decision support tool. Each potential choice is discussed with the patient with the best case of what can happen, contrasted with the worst case, and where the patient, due to their underlying comorbidities, is most likely to fall. This gives their patient, the patient and their family a reference point. 
It appears to help provide better understanding of their goals and expectations for treatment. It helps lead to a better conversation. It also allows it to be framed as a story. A scenario should be realistic and accessible to the patient. It must fit their inner reality to span the distance between their known world and the outer reality of health and illness. This may be particularly important when considering treatment options in the setting of complex and serious health problems. So patients can generate new perceptions about how their illness might unfold. Well-constructed scenarios can help patients comprehend a new, previously unimaginable reality that exposes potential challenges, promoting strategic thinking and preparation for major shifts in a way simple forecasting cannot. In promoting shared decision making, Schwartz has tried to improve on the model proposed by Elwin. The best case, worst case tool is designed specifically for a face-to-face -face clinical interaction to promote dialogue and patient deliberation and support shared decision-making in the context of a life-threatening illness. It's usually best to fill it out before going in to talk with the patient and then going in and being able to present and go over it with them. This helps lead to a truly informed consent. Pattern of conversation is seen here. With an old style of communication, the problem would be linked to a surgical solution. In the new schematic, there would be a choice between valid alternatives. So for the old, so the problem is this. This aortic valve is getting smaller. So in order to take care of this problem, we need to either change the valve or put another valve in. To get that opened up, we need to do surgery. The new, I actually think we have a choice to make. And so that's the kind of where I want to use this little diagram to kind of help go through the choices. So we have to kind of decide which of these paths to take. And a lot of that depends on your sense of where you've been in the last year. As far as description of treatment outcomes, on the old style of communication, it would be a focus on risks and benefits. The risk of reintubation is probably about, you know, 7 to 8 percent. There's a risk of death with esophagectomy. But in a newer paradigm, it would be a focus on outcomes. Under the best of circumstances, that would involve being in the hospital for probably a week, maybe two weeks. Because of your age and the heart problems, part of that might involve being in the intensive care unit. You'd have complications from the surgery that wouldn't allow you to really get better, and you'd die in the intensive care unit or somewhere in the hospital. And that wouldn't occur right away, but it might occur in a few weeks. I'd like to end by talking a little bit about trust. Trust is an important part of the physician-patient relationship. Informed consent is important in helping to safeguard that trust in the medical establishment. Trust is a prerequisite of cooperation. And it's wrong to jeopardize that trust by not truly providing an informed consent. I'm going to end with informed consent. It's more than just a signature on a legal document. It needs to be a process of communication to truly provide an informed consent and to really find out what the patient's choices are. And the trust that's inherent in the bond between physician and patient is fragile and must be carefully protected. Thank you.